Hey guys, my name's Kian Hushman, and in today's video, we're going to be checking out MIDI drum programming and drum samples. Let's have a look. So before we get stuck into it, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone that became a Patreon member. You guys are pretty much the reason why I'm making this video right now because I made a post saying what video I should do next and I got a couple responses saying I should do a video on drum programming. And that's basically what we're going to do today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I go about drum programming, how I get a riff and get the sound that's in my head in relation to the drum sound and then put it into the computer. So if you guys want to have a say on the content that I create as well as getting access to tabs, audio stems, mix critiques and one-on-one -on -one video lessons with me, feel free to check out the Patreon, I'll leave a link in the description. So the riff that we're going to be programming drums over today is a very, very old riff. It was on my YouTube about a year ago and it was on my Instagram even before that, at Keon Hushman Live, I'll leave it somewhere on the screen. So by the end of this video, you guys will see me program this one drum section from start to finish, but for now, let's just jump straight into it so you can see the finished product now and watch to the end of the video to see how we got there. Let's have a look. So before we even start, I should mention that we are using the Periphery 4 uh, drum kit library. And as you can see, I do have the Get Good Drums uh, Halpern pack and the Modded and Massive as well. But I really like the way the P4 kit sounds and I like how easy the symbol matrix is in the sense that there's no um, like, there's for the Modern and Massive, there's a lot of different room channels and there's so many more things that you can do with it. Whereas this one is pretty straightforward. It's just like each mic for a cymbal and then overheads and rooms, that's it. There's not much um, that you can tweak with it, which in a sense for me anyway, is a good thing. And it kind of makes you commit to decisions more as opposed to just trying to tweak everything exactly the way it's meant to be. And of course it sounds absolutely amazing. And I really love the room sound in this one as well. You don't have to be using the exact same drum kit as me or even from the same company. If you have your own drum kit um, and your own sample library, you can apply the techniques that I'm about to show you and everything that I'm doing into your own um, drum library. I should also mention that everything is being processed from the kick to the snare to the toms to the overheads to the room. Everything is being processed at the moment. Everything is on and that's all getting sent to a instrument bus which is then getting sent into a master bus. As you can see here, we have the riff. Now, I'll take all these drum sections off um, and I'll play just the riff without any drum section just so you guys can get a sense of what I was hearing in my head before I even put it into the door and hopefully by listening to this isolated you guys can come up with your own conclusions as to what you'd like to hear the drums as which is an important step of mapping your own drum sound so just without the drums <laughs> Now, when I hear that in my head, in my opinion, um, I think of something that's going like da 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 da, da kind of matching the guitars and giving like a really big chorus feel, kind of putting lots of emphasis on the section and stuff like that. Um, but I have done a couple different examples here so you guys can get an idea of what you could do with it and what you could do with your own um, drum mapping and stuff like that in your own riffs. So the first option I've gone for is something that's a little bit more upbeat, a little bit more happy-go-lucky. As you can see here, there's no names, um, but I'll tell you what they are. So this C here, this is a kick drum. Uh, C sharp, that's the snare. And then E is a hi-hat. So as you can tell, the hi-hat is writing in eighths. So it's going in eighth notes, going one and two and three and four and. Every single one of those is a hi-hat hit. And on the snare, we're going only on the ands. So one and two and three and four and. That's where the snare's happening. And then every time there's a snare hit, basically the kick drum just comes straight after it. Um, kind of gives it like a really like bouncy, happy-go-lucky feel. So playing that with the rest of the song, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> Now, personally, I don't like the way that that sounds for this riff because that's not the sound that I was going for in my head when I first um, listened to it. So when I listened to it, I was going for something that was more like this. Now, before we even play it, let's just go through it a little bit. So as you can see here, we still have the eights on a cymbal, but it's not the hi-hat anymore. It's a crash. And on every second bar to accompany that crash, um, we have a China. 
And that's just to give a little bit more emphasis and how a drummer would actually play. Like for every section, you'd maybe hit two cymbals instead of the one, just to give a little bit of contrast to the middle of the riff and the start and end. You can also see here that the snares are in different spots. So instead of being on the ends, they're on the two and four. So it's going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And the kicks aren't following the snares anymore. They're actually following the guitar and the bass. And this is a very common practice in a lot of modern music, uh, metal, not even just metal, just like a lot of modern music at the kick drum kind of matches the melody in a way and kind of gives everything a little bit more oomph. Putting that technique over a whole song probably isn't the best idea, um, but putting it in certain sections like this where especially it's like a chorus type of thing and kind of really drives the song is a really smart idea. So hearing this with the riff, this is what it sounds like. I like the way that that sounds a lot better. And I know you've probably noticed down here that these velocity levels are pretty bad. Like they're not the way they're meant to be. Usually velocity levels should be all over the place and you should be thinking about the drummer and not just have everything playing at a single velocity across the whole kit. And I've done that very deliberately so I can show you guys the difference between this and another one that I've done at the end of the video so we can draw a comparison between what it would sound like with a real drummer playing it technically and what it would sound like with computerized drums playing it. And now the third one, it's very, very similar to the second one, but as you can see here, the cymbal hits aren't as consistent. We have it on the quarter note instead of the eighth note. So it's going da, 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 da. Very, very doomy, um, very groovy, very moody, and kind of shifts the whole um, emphasis of the riff. You can also see that the snare is not being played on two and four anymore. It's only one per bar and it's playing on the third. So it's going one, two, three, four, one, two, three four and that really makes everything sound like nice and low and nice and groovy and everything like that same thing with the accompaniment especially when you're going for those like low kind of low driven riffs and stuff like that on the drum set i tend to like putting everything on the china and then further accenting the bars with the crashes as opposed to the section before where we're using the crashes and accenting it with the china so now playing that this is what it sounds like Now you probably notice at the end of this section that the bass drum doesn't match up with the guitars at all. It's still playing it as if it was in this section. See that matches but this doesn't match at all. And we can make that match very easily but I'll do that later. So now that I've showcased like the different types of feels and stuff you can go for, um, it's basically just picking which one you think sounds best. Personally, I think the second one sounds best, but the third one could also go with it as well in the sense that you probably notice that a lot of bands like to do this. They like to have the chorus and then they'll do the verse and then they'll play that same chorus again after the verse, but then they'll repeat it a second time. And on that second time, it's much slower, much more moody. So they'll go from something like this. <laughs> have a little drum feel and then they'd kick into something like this straight away. Or you could put it in the outro or something like that, just to give a lot more emphasis on the section. So now that I've decided that the second one is my favorite, what we've got going right now, again, just to recap, is the eighth notes going on the crash. Every second bar is being accented by a china. The snare is playing on two and four, and the kick drum is following the guitars. Kind of gives it that same like nice happy-go-lucky feel of the first one without that snare being on every end. It kind of makes it a little bit more broken up, in my opinion. It gives a little bit more room for everything else to breathe. So now that we've got that, what I'm going to do now is show you what I can do by using that as a template and then further... Um, expanding on it and adding little sections and taking sections away and adjusting velocity levels as you can see down here. 
So before we even get into any of that, I'll just play it with this new altered section that I've done, which is just built on the foundations of this second one, just so you guys can hear the difference. I think that one sounds the best and that's something that I'm really happy with and really happy with committing to. I should probably also mention that everything that I'm saying right now is not gospel. This isn't like the one way to do everything. This is just how I like to do it and this is what I've learned um, by watching a lot of videos and kind of trying everything out myself. So yeah, so let's get into it a little bit more. So as you can see here, between four, pattern four, which is the new one, and pattern two, which is the old one, it's mostly the same, but there are some differences. Um, you can see here that this eighth note thing is still happening, but it's being broken up across different symbols. And there are certain sections where it's being broken up completely. As you can see here, we go from like a, th a group of thirds here, instead of just writing it on here, we kind of break it up and make it follow the kick drum so that it gives a little bit more emphasis on the drum part. And then it goes straight back into that um, eighth note. Here we've got a little drum fill and then here it follows the guitars again like I was saying before the second half of it didn't match up and now we've made it match up and this is what it sounds like so we've got the dum 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 and then we've got the different cymbal playing on each kick so let's just break down every section individually so we'll start off with the kick drum now by highlighting this kick drum here, you can pretty much do this in every door. I can now set the velocity levels of exactly each kick along the whole pattern. Um, I've already done that, so I'll just go through what I've done. So as you can see here, first of all, you should be finding like the right level for your kit. So what I mean by that is every sample drum kit has like a different level where it sounds really good. And in my opinion, around here where this kind of line is floating around, I feel like that's where the P4 kit sounds really, really good. The snares ring out just right. The kicks are just perfect. That's where I feel like it sounds good, especially in the context with this riff. Before we start, I'll mention that drummers only have two hands and two feet, obviously. You've probably heard that a million times. So don't be putting like a cymbal, a snare, and a tom here all at the same time because it's just not going to happen. Drummers can't do that. And you also need to remember that drummers are human as well so they're not going to hit everything the exact the same not going to hit everything the exact same level every single time and they're not going to hit it in time you notice that the first hit is like pretty much in line with that like a linear kind of sweet spot which is fine and then the second one you can see that there's like two notes bunched together and i'm picturing it as if it's been playing on the same foot so if the right foot is playing those two notes one after each other and you notice that with the most drummers when there's two notes lined up quickly like that it's often the second note is more emphasized, so they'll go dun dun. Like the second one will be harder because they're pushing all the pressure on their back foot or whatever. So with that in mind, you get a softer hit to start with and then a harder hit. Things like that, they're really, really subtle, but they do make all the difference. And as you can see for this double kick section here, I've kind of like adjusted everything as if one foot is stronger than the other, because that's what it is most of the time, I think anyway, um, that one foot is going to be stronger than the other. And the drummer's going to hit them at different velocities, even if they're in time. And then it's just kind of following that general pattern. As you can see, we have another bunch of two notes here with the first one being softer. Same thing here, um, adjusting these double kick levels so they're not all at the same velocity. Especially here when we've got the 16th notes going in the drum fill in this section here. When you're playing 16th notes, I feel like a drum would play them just a little bit quieter because you're focused so much on moving around the kit that you don't have the time to like make sure you're pressing everything or like hitting everything as hard. So as you can see here, this section is kind of a little bit softer than everything else. As you're moving across the toms and the snare, and the, uh, the kicks, they're gonna always gonna be a little bit quieter. The snare I've kept at that sweet spot pretty much the whole time. Um, as you can see, apart from that little drum feel where there's two sixteenths right next to each other, but over here, they're pretty much all in that like linear kind of line where they're all hitting that perfect sweet spot where they all sound like this. All sound like this, sorry. It's kind of like the perfect snare here, it rings out just enough. Um, 
And uh, that's just where I like to keep it when I'm going through like a groovy section like this where I'm not hitting the snare as much. So you notice that when I highlight all the symbols that the first beat on like most bars is louder. And the reason why I like doing that is because if I was a drummer, that's how I would drum. Like I would drum the first beat is louder so you can hit the ta and then kind of get a little bit quieter and then put more emphasis when it starts again. And it kind of just gives everything a little bit more of a groove um, in the sense that it's not all static and all in one spot. One thing I will adjust now that I didn't adjust before is these three triplets here where it's like da da da. I'm gonna actually put them louder because if I wanted that to be played pretty loud as it's like an accent a bit and it's going off the norm of what the rest of the song is. So it's putting more emphasis on those three notes. Now if that changed. You probably notice that when it plays these first sets of cymbals here and then it progresses onto the eighth notes, that the eighth notes are a little bit quieter just to give a little bit more room in the mix. And that's just so that I feel like the guitars can breathe a little bit more, the bass can breathe a little bit more, and it doesn't overcrowd everything, it doesn't make everything sound robotic. So when it's like a general chorus section like this, I like using the crash, I feel like that's a great symbol to use. Um, and as well, if you're going for like the accents, using the china is great as well. You could also change that to another symbol. It really just depends what you feel like doing. I feel like using the china in this instance and then using in those like group of threes, they're using the other symbol to accent. And then notice that in that third pattern that we were going through before, where it's that slow groove. We're using the china instead of the crash. But for this instance, I feel like the crash is a good symbol to use. So now that we have an understanding of like velocities and where to put the kick drum, um, I'll just go through like my decision making on why I put certain things where and stuff like that. So this little drum fill. because it's leading into another section as you can see here this is the first bar second bar third bar and then fourth bar and then on those last two um full notes in the court not full notes those last two quarter notes of the uh the last bar it's leading into that second section where it's pretty much just a repeat so by having the little drum feel there it's giving the listener a sense of okay something's ending something's about to start and it might be a little bit different to what it was before. As opposed to just writing out that same symbol pattern across the whole thing and just makes the section seem like too big, it makes it seem too long. But when you break it up with a little drum feel like that, it really opens it up and does sound kind of cool as well. And now how I actually chose the things that I put in that drum feel. So as you can see here, we have a kick and then we split it up into 16th notes instead of 8th. So right now this is 8th and then 16th here. I have the, the higher tune tom before the lower one. So as if it's moving across the kit like da um, And the snare between the kick and the sound. So just following like a little, um, a little riddle across the drum kit, that's all. Um, when the kicks are eights here, I've put two cymbal crashes. Um, I've put, uh, sorry, I put a crash and a china to match these two kicks here, and then given it a little bit of breathing room with another kick with no cymbal above it. So by having that, before it was just an empty space, which sounded a little bit weird. In the context of the mix, I should probably add. Kind of just made it seem like that drum feel was a little bit forced, um, which I guess it is in a sense, but um, having that kick before it makes it sound a little bit more, 
natural, if that makes sense. At the end of the day, there's no right or wrong way on how to make a drum feel. Um, basically, I just get a sound that's in my head and just apply it to whatever it is. So if it's ticka 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 ticka, I'll map that out onto a drum kit. So it'd be snare, snare, kick, kick, snare, snare, kick, kick, or something like that. And in this case, I swapped out the snares for some toms. And I knew that I wanted it to be 16th notes because it was quicker. Or you could make it moving across the kit, you could go like snare and tom at the same time, snare, tom, kick, snare, tom, kick, snare, tom, kick, something like that. Um, it's good to like research drum fills and stuff or just generally just watch your favorite bands and their drummers and how they do fills and stuff so you can get an idea of how to put it into your own music if that's something that you're going for. And then straight back into the eighth note. Going on that little triplet thing again. Notice how it's not this. It's not following that same pattern, it's breaking up and it's adding another symbol. Kind of breaking up that eighth note pattern and going into like thirds. Makes it a little bit more groovy. Um, kind of makes everything breathe a little bit more. It's not like overcrowding the place with a bunch of crashes and stuff. So at the end of the day, that's pretty much all there is to it. It's just getting the sound in your head that you hear with the riff and putting it down. In this instance, the sound in my head was the kick matching up with the guitars, um, the snare on that two and four, um, and then the symbols just riding on eighths, but it's changing between certain sections and I have that little break up in between um, just to give a little bit more emphasis on the guitars in that section. Um, I have the China accenting a couple times and most of it's just riding out on the one crash and then just like little drum fills here and there to kind of make it a little bit more fancy if that makes sense. But overall playing all of that from start to finish. And if I wanted to repeat that chorus a second time in the second section, I'd use a drum beat like this. So straight after here. I'd go into something like this. So again, it's just about finding what you think sounds best for the riff. We went through a couple of examples where the snare was on the and, so and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. You also had the hi-hat riding on the eights. One and two and three and four and. And the kick was just following the snare, which kind of made everything sound a little bit more happy, a little bit more um, energetic. but. In my opinion, I don't think it fit with the riff that much. The second one, which is the, pretty much the basis of that last one we created, the second one is what I imagined it in my head. And instead of like writing out those eighth notes across the whole thing um, and, you know, not having the drum feel, we've made some minor adjustments. just to get the most out of the riff and kind of make it interesting. Again, it's all about context. It's what you put around the riff that makes it interesting. Um, you could have just a simple rock beat over this and it would sound like nothing special. It is nothing special. It's literally just some chords in a very generic pattern, but adding the drum part and adding certain things to it kind of makes it a little bit more lively and brings the most out of the riff. <laughs> And then follow it up with this. Could definitely be used in a song, to be honest. I might do it myself.
And that's pretty much it. So if you guys like this video at any time, please feel free to leave a like and a comment on anything you saw or heard. If you learned anything from this video, definitely let me know. I love knowing that you guys are learning something from these videos and applying it to your own music. If you want the audio stems, the tabs, the drum MIDI, all that stuff for this file, for this song, definitely check out the Patreon because that's where I put all of this stuff. If you want to see more of this stuff, definitely subscribe because I love doing this stuff. I love showing you guys how I go about doing it because um, that's interesting apparently and useful to some people. So I don't mind showing you guys, but until next time, I'll catch you guys later. Thank you so much for watching. Ciao.